How's it going, everybody? This is Ron Sparkman from Opportunity U. I love Mars and the Mars Society's Red Planet Radio. And today we have an amazing interview. We are speaking with Dr. Geronimo Villanova from NASA Goddard Space Center. He is a Mars specialist uh, focusing on Mars oceans, Mars life past and present, uh, the possibilities of life, that is. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Villanova, it's welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Ron, for having me in your show. We're glad to have you. And uh, so I was able to see you a few years ago at the Mars Society Convention, and it is obvious this is something you were very passionate about. So what originally sparked your passion for space and science? Yeah, that's interesting. So I was lucky when I was in Argentina and my supervisors there, they were studying the Earth, the ocean hole in the, in the southern hemisphere, close to the Antarctica. And they say, why don't we do, and then they started to do that. And then I went to Germany and boom, boom, boom. And I'm, I'm doing Mars stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how these things kind of chase after us. I know, uh, I know, I know. It was not expected, but it happened that way. So the, it, for those that don't know, uh, what does a planetary scientist do? Like, we've only really got one that we can, that we can yeah. actually visit. So what kind of work do you do? So planetary science do a little bit of, a, the, I mean, like small bodies and big planets. And you have people who do study rocks. Some people study like geologies, or some people study atmospheres. I mean, I'm a very planetary scientist, so I study the atmospheres of planets, and it could be like a plumes of Europa, or it could be the atmosphere of Mars, for example. So when most people think about the James Webb Telescope, one of the new exciting telescopes that's coming our way next year, they don't really think so much about Mars as they think about the far-reaching research that we will be able to do. But you're going to be working on Mars studies with the telescope. Can you tell us a bit about what you'll be looking to accomplish on Mars studies with the James Webb? Well, this one, I, as you were saying, it's a fantastic tool for distant and faint stuff. And we, for Mars, it's difficult because it's close, bright, and it's difficult for James Webb. But James Webb is, is a great thing. It's above our own atmosphere, it's super sensitive, and it has a beautiful set of instruments. So we can investigate the organic composition, if there are any organics in the atmosphere, some, anything releasing material from the subsurface of Mars. Maybe we can also investigate the water vapor and maybe see there is an ancient stuff going on there, some plumes of water. So James Webb was not designed for such a study, but I think we're going to get great science with James Webb on Mars. Excellent. And another project that you worked on was ExoMars. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on with that mission these days and how exactly you're involved in it? Well, you know, ExoMars was a mission that was designed originally NASA and NASA joined forces and said we're going to have this great mission to investigate trace gases, methane, water, and stuff on Mars. But then NASA ran out of money and pulled out of the mission. So okay. the mission was in limbo, and I, I'm, I am one of the survivors of the mission. And so luckily NASA allowed me to stay in the mission and the Russians fill the gap of the Americans, I mean NASA. So the mission continued going. So now it's primarily an European Russian mission. And it launched last year and it's gonna be the first time we can actually look for organic material on the atmosphere with high precision. So it's gonna map the whole planet. We're gonna search for trace amounts of stuff. It's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be amazing. But we need, need to wait uh, almost one year now for the or, uh, the spacecraft to get into orbit mm -hmm. to actually start to take data. So we don't we don't we don't have a lot of data right now. Excellent. And uh, I know it's one of the big things that most people when they when they talk about searching for life, it's should we drill? Should we you know look at things that are actually on the surface? So to hear missions that are really working in the atmospheric side of things is really kind of an interesting turn from the majority of other people I've either spoken with and even done interviews with. So uh, it's exciting to see what's coming with that. And are there any other upcoming uh, projects on Mars that you'll be working on, such as the Mars 2020 rover? Uh, and if so, what can we expect to see from those? So we, the ExoMars mission has another component called the lander that's going to drill on Mars in 2020. So we are like, we are what we're doing with them is define where they should be thinking about landing. We are helping it is to assist with our measurements we do right now. So I think we're gonna um, we're involved in that in some way to help with the design, the, the, the landing site. And then we're trying to fight uh, for an orbiter in 2022, 2024, that, that had some of the capabilities of ExoMars, but now NASA-led mission. So we're working on that. Excellent. And wow. as you've continued to mention, uh, mention, a lot of these things that we're talking about are really leading towards the possibility of finding finally finding life on Mars, past, present, uh, so that's really kind of exciting. Astrobiology has become really popular in recent years as we draw closer to 
possibly finding life on moons like Europa and on Mars. So what sort of hints or evidence have you seen so far that lead you to the conclusion that we may find life on the red planet? Well, I mean, astrobiologists say it's, a, it's an interesting topic. So, I mean, I'm, I'm mainly a physicist, so I know very little about life. But you need to learn how to look for life. It's very complicated. So one of the things we do is try to look for things that should not be happening on a planet. And we look for, I, I call them chemical disequilibriums. We're looking for that. And the fact that we found that methane stuff uh, some years ago, it was a surprise. It should not be there. It wasn't something that it has to be producing that. So, but could be also geology producing it, or we don't know what could, why is there. So I think that's a big hint, but we're not so sure. The measurements are borderline precise. So I think this, we need missions, we need you know right instruments to make the measurements. But at the moment, I don't know. I, if there's any life on Mars, it has to be below the surface, and it's going to be difficult to, to, to track it down because it's, you know, you have to drill. It's not easy, but we're looking to see if there, anything of that is coming out in the atmosphere, we can see it. Excellent. And another big topic has been panspermia, and a lot of people have been interested in possibly since Mars had a less tumultuous beginning that maybe life could have spawned there, something could have happened, it could have come to, to Earth and then, you know, became us eventually. So what are the really the possibilities that life spawned on Mars and then through, uh, you know, an asteroid strike, we got to see life here. And is there any evidence of that or something that leads us to believe that maybe that may have happened? Well, that's a good point. So it's a very good question. So we don't know very well. So the key thing about this is that we do think right now that the, 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 the building blocks of life, the soup of life, we can say, came from a small bodies. We think a lot of people are kind of agree on that. There's a debate, but it kind of agree on that. That means that all those bodies came to our planet and also came to Mars. But the conditions in our planet at the, at the beginning, the first billion years, were a very a little bit erratic. It was not so good for life. On the other side, Mars was much more stable, and that time was actually a very habitable place. So maybe something happened on Mars, and then you know spread, and then came to an Earth, which was becoming to become habitable, and then life started. So the question is: uh, Is it possible? It is possible. But it's also complicated. You need, you need to have create life in a different planet, and then transport it to our planet, survive the whole trip. You could also make it here. So you know it's a possibility. But it, I mean, why you have to make it so complicated? I don't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's what we. Whatever we look at the universe, it does seem to be that things just a more complicated, right? I know. No, it's like crazy. So yes, I, I I like the idea. So it's a possibility. Yeah. Um, so another one is the possibility of a second genesis, that the life here has absolutely nothing to do with life there. So uh, is that a more likely possibility, that there was just another spark of life? And what implications could that have for our search on life in the universe? If it's a second genesis, will that mean that we're going to probably see it more or less? Now, that's a great question. So it's difficult because, you know, we are we are defined, the, the, the search, our instruments are based on what we know about life. You know, we are heavily biased on water searches. We're heavily based on organic composition, but is that a common way of life? Life required us, or you know, can we can we do without that? Can this life in a different form? So we don't know. One of the things we when we talk to biologists, and they, they always tell you they do require some building blocks. So the as we know for life in general, it wants chemical diversity, an energy source, and some sort of a quiet environment initially to develop. And in membranes, they call it the first thing. So membranes are well done with organic material. So I think you know you could have different life, but the building blocks should be similar. What? Very interesting. Yeah, it should be an anthropocentric definition, but we think that that's kind of what we go in that direction, based on what we know from you know uh, structures on, on our on our planet. Excellent. Well, life in the universe has been a big topic, but obviously just going to Mars period has been uh, quite a big topic since The Martian came out. There's been a lot of the TV show with Nat Geo. So we're really seeing it a lot more. But what are maybe some recent findings that you and your colleagues have found that haven't been what the mainstream news would say are, you know, giant headlines, but are really still important to the reasons that the public will continue to support these Mars missions and eventually humans on Mars? Well, I mean, this, this, I mean, we have learned a lot about planet Mars. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't know, we just knew it was a red planet, but we didn't know anything. Now, you know, we haven't, uh, for some right now, we have an inventory of all the ices on planet Mars. We know where they are, how much volume of water is stored everywhere. 
that is incredible. It's a, it's a, it's a, that knowledge, you know, that we take it for granted now has been accumulated. And just, it's pretty recent that we have that inventory. I think that's great because now if you want to know where the water is, how much water was in the past, or if you want to drill and get some water resources for human exploration, those are big things. So that's one of the things. I mean, the, the fact that we know so well about the surface of Mars and these high quality uh, maps of the inventory in the ages that we are getting right now, I think they are help us a lot with the human exploration that, you know, we don't hear a lot in the news because they're like, you know, oh, it's a map of Mars. But I think they're critical for our you know, future steps if you want to go there. Excellent. And we now have a new astronaut class that everybody's been talking about. They're all uh, top of the line. And it looks like there's the possibility that they, one of them could be the first humans to walk on Mars. So what are really some of the things that, that you and your colleagues are looking forward to when someone actually sets foot on Mars and comes back? What information do you need that would allow you to do your job a little better? that a Martian astronaut could be able to be involved in? Well, I mean, as you say, we are so happy with the new class because they are a, a, it's a good technical knowledge, uh, you know, spacecraft knowledge, but also they are good scientists. So we're super excited about that. So one of the great things about that we see about the, that this, this astronaut we, they can do, you know, we can send robots and do stuff, but having someone go in there with the knowledge to pick a rock, pick the right rock, and is on, you know, in, intelligent to get we can get the best samples we can get back because you know we can send sophisticated spacecraft there you know by the laboratory the knowledge we can send there is limited having rocks brought here collected by astronauts our knowledge of mars can expand dramatically i mean look at what we've been doing with the moon we still process the rocks from the moon and we still learn every day about how the moon is was it was created how we are being created so i think you know the, the same thing will happen with mars we collect the right samples with the right people and that would allow us to to make a giant leap in our what we think about Mars. Excellent. And one of the big topics is obviously water on Mars. You know, will we have enough there to sustain anything from an outpost to a colony? Will we bring our own? Those kind of those kind of topics. But one of the most popular pictures actually we've ever shared on uh, I Love Mars was a photo that you worked on that shows. Mars, but with the oceans on it. And it's a really, really, I mean, it really, it kind of, it's interesting how it makes you look at that planet so much differently. Uh -huh. And uh, so what kind of work went into figuring out what Mars oceans may have looked like? Yeah, actually that, that, that plot is funny because it, it you know, it came by accident in some way. So I, uh, I was trying to understand how much water is something. So I, I, I we know how much water right now is on Mars. And I knew that we had in the past seven times more water than we have right now. But I, I didn't have a flavor for how much water was. So I just say, what is this water? How much water? No? And then I, I, what I did, I had the topography of Mars, and I throw that water on the planet, just you know, follow the topo topography of the planet, and to see where the water will flow and create an ocean. I just did that. And you can see it created this huge ocean up there. It's like, oh my god, yeah. If you combine the topography as symmetries of Mars, which is, we know that, and it has been always, in, always been that way. With that amount of water, which was a lot of water, then you create, create an ocean. So that was a pretty remarkable uh, thing. Another thing that would make me very happy is that you can create like a shoreline of where the ocean was. And people in uh, doing imaging of Mars have found there was like a shoreline there. Like they saw like, you know, like the curvature of uh, something was, water was coming there. The fact that we can simulate this and matches those geomorphology pictures that was pretty pretty cool. So yeah, it's a, that's a pretty cool result. It's just topography and amount of water. Excellent. And uh, so one final one really regarding Mars is one of the things that we are consistently confused by is what happened with the atmosphere of Mars. What happened that it was stripped away? The the oceans, the lakes, the rivers are are gone now. Is there any recent evidence or any any sort of news that maybe is leading us towards an answer on what happened with that? Well, I mean, we, I mean, Navy has been fantastic. We, we, we now very well now we can, you know, there are multiple processes. And I think we are getting an idea which are the main processes and we'll still learn. But Mars was, was, has one quality that we actually always knew. It's in the wrong size, has the wrong size and wrong temperature, we can say. So it's small enough that a little bit of temperature will make a molecules escape pretty easily. So you, yeah. so yeah, it's kind of a little bit hot so it means the molecules can escape. I mean, for example, Venus is bigger, or our planet is bigger. 
So molecules are more attached to the planet. The, the atmosphere don't escape so easily. But Mars is a smaller planet. It was hot enough to, for escape to happen and never developed a magnetic field, a strong magnetic field. So the planet was didn't have the right things and it was small. And then comparing with all the complicated processes happening for the escape, Mars was uh, the unlucky guy in the solar system and got stripped of, the, of its own atmosphere. And it's always crazy that Mars is the one that doesn't have one. And then on the other side of us, Venus, which is just Boom. crazy. Yeah, crazy. yeah, yeah. Like, so, you know, about it, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right, right in the same, right in the same spot. So, um, you're going to be updating people at the Mars Society Convention on the search for past and current life. That's going to be pretty awesome. I'm looking forward to it. I will be there myself, um, working on a, a panel as well. So, is there anything you'd like to tease the audience with uh, to kind of get them excited about the talk that you're going to that or the lecture that you're going to give as well? well I mean, I mean, Mars so as I'm studying this mission called ExoMars, we got some uh, preliminary data. We call it calibration data, but it has a lot of scientific value. And I think it's going to be the first time we can actually look for trace gases with an orbiter. It will tell us a lot about organics, tell about you know ancient life uh, or you know ancient oceans. So we are going to present some preliminary data that we just took in March, and let's see how it looks like. We ha I have to say I have not seen it yet myself, but I know it's going to be cool. So I think by September, October, we're going to have it and we're going to present it at the meeting. Yeah. Awesome. Well, for everybody listening, you got to make sure to get your tickets so that way you can come check it out. Trust me, you will you will love listening to uh, lengthier amounts of time with Geronimo. He's he's great to listen to. Uh, and final question: So you're a passionate science communicator, and conventions like the Mars Society Convention are really where you shine, and you're able to really speak with the public and, and connect with us. Uh, what advice do you have for upcoming upcoming science communicators that want to help bolster public awareness? Well, I mean, I think one of the good, good things about uh, science communication that you, once you're given the opportunity to speak, which is nice, you can speak about your own science, which is your privilege. I think it's important you always talk and in a in a in a simple manner. You know, scientists we tend to like to use complicated words or things like that, and I try to minimize that as much as possible because it's just why we're gonna. I mean, it's already a complicated topic. Why do we gonna make it more complicated? So I think make it accessible and relate. You know, ultimate goals with define goals and use basic language. I think that helps a lot to communicate science and, and makes people more interested in our in our science. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Geronimo. We learned a lot and uh, I can't personally wait to hear you speak again at the Mars Society Convention here in just a few months. And uh, thank you for coming on and hopefully we'll be able to catch up with you maybe uh, sometime soon and get even more information out of that brain of yours. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for allowing me to be in the show, okay? Take, take yeah. care. And thank you, everybody. We will see you on the next episode. Bye-bye.